this is joint work which hopefully will soon appear on the archive with uh, Sonia Hollock, Silvia Sabatini and Margaret Symington. And uh, it's interesting because Hamiltonian group actions have cropped up in a good uh, portion of the talks. We've heard about them in the Poisson category, in, in the Dirac category just now. And uh, however, just because I'd like to end the day on, a, on an easy note, I'll go back to symplectic. So I will only tell you about a four-dimensional story. And uh, let me remind you of what, of what an integrable system is. Um, Alvaro already defined this. But uh, so a completely integrable Hamiltonian system on, as I said, I only consider a four-dimensional manifold. Well, let's think of it as a map phi to R2 and these components satisfy two conditions and the first one says that they Poisson commute and there goes my token Poisson and then you'd like this map to be a submersion say almost everywhere on an open then set. So for those of you who attended Deva's course last week, she talked about this in the Poisson category, amongst other things. And I have to thank Eva because she actually pointed out to me that uh, there is a result that says that every symplectic manifold you can think of admits one of these. However, if you look at the proof of this nice result, um, you can say absolutely nothing about the singular locus, the points where this fails to be a submersion. And I want to motivate this talk by the following hard question. So suppose that M omega is a compact four-dimensional manifold. Does it admit a, well, I'd like to say completely integrable Hamiltonian system, but I just told you that it does. So let me call, let me make some sort of very silly comment here, well behaved. So I'm not, I'm, I will eventually tell you what I mean by well behaved. But um, in some sense, I'm asking the integrable system to have singularities which I can put my hands on. And there are different notions of what it means to put your hands on a singularity. And for the purposes of this talk, you should think of but well behaved as a type of Morse bot condition in the symplectic category. Okay, so you expect quadratic behavior of the singularities at the singular points. And this is hard because, well, I don't know how to answer it. And I suspect most people don't know how to answer it, but you know, uh, it's also late in the afternoon. So, um, so I don't know what you do when you uh, bump into a very hard question that you'd like to solve. My favorite thing is to put some assumptions and cross my fingers so that I haven't turned a hard question into a tautology, okay? So I'll put an assumption, and that is I will not start from a compact four-dimensional manifold. I will start, I will add something and so the idea, so we will add some symmetry. And what do I mean by this? Well, instead of starting with, on a compact four-dimensional manifold, I would have to come up with two functions. Now, it's much easier to come up with one function than two, right? And, and so I'll start with a given function. And I'm going to require that this given function be as nice as possible. So this function will in fact induce a Hamiltonian S1 action. And this is the notion of a Hamiltonian S1 space. So a Hamiltonian S1 space is a four manifold together with a Hamiltonian S1 action and J is just the moment map of this S1 action, a moment map of a Hamiltonian S1 action, and let me, and throughout, I will assume that it's effective. And in some sense, effectiveness, well, formally effectiveness says that the only element of S1 that acts as the identity on all points of M is the identity. And is only the identity. And let me give you three good reasons, which are all intertwined, for why making this, adding this symmetry makes sense. The first one is, in the presence of compact abelian symmetries, we've heard a lot about 
nice results like the atiyah gilliman sternberg convexity theorem. Also, there is the dalsamat heckman measure. So you know a lot about these things. Let me give you a second heuristic reason. Now, you heard about Hamiltonian reduction, OK? So you take a compact symplectic manifold, you reduce it at a regular value by the Hamiltonian S1 space, you'll get a compact two-dimensional symplectic manifold. Now, luckily, two dimensions is the only place where we completely classify compact symplectic manifolds. So we understand them. And the third reason why I'm making this, which is very much intertwined with the two previous ones, is that we understand these. They've been classified. So these have been classified by Yael Karshon. And I will tell you about this classification in about seven minutes. And she built on work of Michel Odin and Ahara and Hattori. And it's a beautiful classification. It's in a monograph, and I strongly recommend you read it uh, if you have nothing to do between six and seven tonight. So, OK. But still, even with this requirement, so let me make, so this, I'll call this a guiding question. So which Hamiltonian S1 spaces admit an integrable system, so well-behaved integrable systems. By that, I mean I have, I already have one of the functions, and I'd like to cook up a way of constructing another function, which makes it into an integrable system. Now, this is still hard. So yes, so I have, again, to play the game and put some assumptions. And there's a very nice category of integrable systems that Alvaro spoke about today, which are semitoric systems. And these are the ones that I will deal with. These were introduced, if I'm not mistaken, by Sambu Nock, mathematically, but as Alvaro mentioned, there are physically relevant examples. So a semitoric system, for us, in this talk, it will be defined on a compact four-dimensional manifold, but it need not. So the, the work that I will quote due to Alvaro and to Sanbu Nock actually goes on for non-compact manifold as well, which is amazing. So it's a completely integrable system. Satisfying two properties. And well, the second property will be that if I forget about the second function, I get a Hamiltonian S1 space. And the first property is that all the singular points are so-called non-degenerate and not hyperbolic. OK, you're like, OK, fine. You've given me, you've given us a lot of adjectives. Show us what you mean by this. Non-degenerate singularities are the ones that we can, in some sense, linearize. This is an old theorem of Eliasson, which has been strengthened by several people in the audience, most importantly by Eva Miranda and Guyen Ten Zung. And other people in the audience have worked on filling in the gaps on origin, uh, in the original proof by Eliasson. Effectively, what do I mean? I mean that locally, the singularities have some nice local normal forms. So I can find some Dabu coordinates and some diffeomorphism of the image of the moment map, such that locally they look like this. The first ones are called elliptic-elliptic, and they look like a corner in a <coughs> Delzan polygon. The second one are called elliptic-regular. So the first one is a fixed point. This one is a whole family. It's a circle. And it's the type of singularity that occurs on an edge, on the interior of an edge of a Delzan polygon. So, so far, toric, you've heard a lot about toric things. And then there is something uh, new, this focus focus singularity. It takes this form, the image of the moment map is everything, including the origin. And over the origin, there isn't just the singular point, there are actually some other orbits. So, in fact, this is a significant difference between the first two cases and the third. The first two cases, when you look, in the first two cases, when you look at the pre-image of these maps, you get not just the fibers, but orbits. So the fibers are the orbits. That's great. That's very good. 
in the focus focus case, you look at the pre-image of the singular value, and it doesn't just comprise of one orbit. And that's bad. And when I say bad, I mean great. Okay? Because, in fact, that gives rise to rich behavior. And, and so, right. So now, I've put enough assumptions, and you hope that I don't have to put any further to solve the problem. And you're right. So this is the main result. The main result is that, so this is what we've proved, is that we give necessary and sufficient conditions for a Hamiltonian S1 space to be completed to a semitoric system. Now, you see, one of the reasons why you should believe, and by completion, I mean exactly this procedure. So you cook up the second integral so that it is a semitoric system. And again, there is a good reason why we can do this. This, this have been classified by Alvaro Pelayo and Sambung Ok under a, generis, a, a generic condition, which I will not go into. So classified by Pelayo and Mung Ok. So for the rest of the talk, what I will do is try to explain to you how we prove this. And in order to explain to you how we do this, um, I have to make first a remark, and that is the way I think about this is that this is a generalization. So this generalizes um, the, no the criteria to go from a Hamiltonian S1 space to a toric, symplectic toric manifold. So in particular, this is also due to Karshun. You can ask, well, I have an S1 worth of symmetries on my compact symplectic four manifold. Can I make it into T2 worth of symmetry? The answer is not always. And I will tell you exactly what criteria you need to satisfy. And the criteria that I'll give here will be a non-empty generalization of this, meaning that not all, uh, not all semi uh, so there are Hamiltonian S1 spaces that can be extended to semitoric systems, but not toric ones. And this is non-empty in the sense also that not all Hamiltonian S1 spaces satisfy the criteria that I'll give you. So I have to tell you how to, uh, look at Hamilton and S1 spaces, and so I have to recall Karshan's classification. So what does Karshan do? So if you have any question, please ask. Um, from a Hamilton and S1 space, so this is, she concocts what I'll call a labeled directed graph. So what's a labeled directed graph? Well, a graph is vertices and some edges. Then I'll decorate it with some labels. And there is a direction, which is the direction of increasing j. So for all intents and purposes, you can forget about the second adjective there. And the key idea here, which is beautiful, is the fact that all you need to look at are the subsets of m, which are stabilized by subgroups of S1. So for G, a subgroup of S1, it can be the whole of S1, denote by M upper G the set of points in M whose stabilizer is precisely G. Now, the good thing about this is that we understand all the subgroups of S1. So you have the identity, you have the whole of S1, and you have the K roots of unity. So you don't have a lot of cases here. And let me topologize this with the induced topology. So this is the subspace topology. And let me tell you some facts about mg. So when g is S1, we're now looking at the fixed points. And it's a consequence of the equivariant Darboux theorem. So here you look for 
canonical coordinates which are invariant by the action, that in fact, connected components of MS1 are smooth symplectic submanifolds. Uh, well, the action is effective, so they can be four dimensional. You only have two choices, either zero or two dimensional. I will talk about this as isolated fixed points. And these as fixed surfaces. Moreover, because you are in four dimension, it can be checked that these, if there are any fixed surfaces, they only occur, so only occur at extrema. So if there is a fixed surface, it's either the pre-image of the maximum of the moment map or of the minimum. They can't lie in the middle. OK? Slightly more interestingly, if you look at the k roots of unity, well, you get that. Now you have to look at the closure of connected components are, again, smooth, symplectic spheres. So what's the picture to have in mind? So this, so this is the direction of increasing j. I need some colors. It's quite easy to show that a connected component looks like a cylinder, a connected component of g of zk, uh, m of zk, looks like a cylinder, and the this, the north and south poles of this, of the, of the closure, which is a sphere, are two isolated fixed points. And if I'm dealing with k, these two isolated fixed points, if this is the direction of increasing j, they have the property that one of them has isotropy weight k and the other one minus k. Now, if you don't know what an isotropy weight is, these are fixed points of the action, so you can linearize the, uh, so on TQ, uh, M, you can linearize the action. This is by choosing an S1 equivariant, almost complex structure. You can identify this with C2. Now you have a linear action of S1 on C2. So it splits into two eigenspaces. And these two, lambda 1 and lambda 2, lambda i are integers. And these are called the weights of the action. And because the action is effective, the weights are co-prime. So at each point, you have a pair and a co-prime. OK. So this is, so amazingly, now I can tell you how to construct this labeled directed graph. So here I will tell you how to make, how to define the vertices and edges. And here I will tell you about the labels. And so the vertices are connected components of the fixed point set. And I'll draw them. Let me pick two different colors. I'll draw them very small if they're isolated and very fat if they're fixed surfaces. And the edges are precisely the ZK spheres. And now for the labels, well, the iso so all vertices have the moment map value. So say this occurred, so this is x0, so this in the graph, the, the vertex will come with an x0 on top. And then the fixed surfaces, well, what did I tell you? Two dimension is the only Two, two is the only dimension where we can classify compact symplectic manifolds in that dimension. 
And so what are the invariants? The genus and the symplectic area. So I have to remember those things. Uh, you may normalize the symplectic area, of course. And each, oops, each edge, which corresponds to a ZK, has precisely the K, which I will take it to be positive. Okay, so you may wonder, okay, what does one of these graphs look like? Let me show you some examples. So you have four different ones. You have examples where you only have isolated vertices. You have examples where you have fixed surfaces and edges. And so it's quite easy for the experts to recognize the first two examples on this column and the first one on the top. You can have examples where any genus occurs for the surface in any area it wants. And I can also have something like this, which is slightly less obvious. The bottom, the bottom right graph is a bit more complicated. Not all graphs that you can think of can occur. These, in fact, are quite rigid. In fact, if you say, if you take the top one in the left column, then you go 0, 1, 2, 3 plus epsilon, that doesn't occur for arbitrary epsilon. So you, you can't move them about. They can't wriggle. There's a rigidity somewhere for some of them. I mean, in some cases, you can move them, but you pay a price somewhere. So these graphs classify Kirchhoff graphs, uh, Hamiltonian S1 spaces, up to S1 equivalent uh, symplectomorphism. And what is it that I would like to say now? Do, 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 do. Yes, that now. What I'd like to show to you is how to go from a symplectic toric manifold to a Cartesian graph. So here is a, a four-dimensional symplectic toric manifold. It's a Hirzebruck surface. So in order to go to the Cartesian graph, I'm projecting down to the second component, to the first component, sorry. So I'm, it's like projecting down to the x-axis. Every time I see a vertical edge, I put a fat vertex. And all vertices which don't lie on Vertical edges correspond to, to isolated fixed points. So I draw a, uh, just an iso well, a, a vertex there. And then the labels, well, are clear. The moment map labels are just the first component of the vertices. And for well, the symplectic area is the length of the vertical edge. And the genus is always 0. And now if you want to put edges in, you have to check the primitive tangent vectors to the edges. In this case, you check them. And one, if one of them has the first component that is different to 1 in absolute value, then you draw an edge between the corresponding vertices, and you put the absolute value of that there. And so from this, you can say, well, OK. So I told you that only the genus 0 case occurs. So fixed surfaces always have genus 0. And then. You will never have a case where you have either three uh, vert you know, vertices in the graph or three edges which are collinear in the sense that they all intersect the same x value because, well, it's a polygon. So, you know, it's a convex polygon. In fact, it's a theorem to the Cartesian. So let me write this down. Um, this can be extended to a toric system or manifold if and only if you have two conditions. The first one is that the genus of any fixed surface has to be 0. And the second one is that I'll write it down and then I'll explain it again. You cannot have more than two non-free orbits on a level set that is the interior. So you take a level set, you take a point in between the minimum and the maximum of the moment map, and you look for the number of non-free orbits. Now, non-free orbits correspond to isolated fixed points or ZK spheres. So let me go back to this picture. On your left, the graphs are extendable, so you can, they satisfy this criterion. On the right, if I pick G to be 574, that's not extendable because it doesn't satisfy the first criterion. 
And the second one is not extensible because you see at x equals 3, I have a zk sphere, another zk sphere, I have two, and I also have a vertex, an isolated fixed point. So I have three non-free orbits when x is 3. So this is not satisfied. So this is an example of, a, of something that can be extended, to a toric one. And let me also remark, I mean, let me also remark that she proves this, she also proved something amazing that if, if there are only isolated fixed points, then it's okay. So by that I mean that if your Hamiltonian S1 space only has isolated fixed points, well, it satisfies E1 trivially, and it also satisfies E2 automatically. But still, in spite of the fact that toric manifolds are not, so not all Hamiltonian S1 spaces can be extended to toric manifolds, there's something quite remarkable, which is that, and again, this is something that Kershon proved. So if the Hamiltonian S1 space satisfies the first condition, so this condition on the genus of the fixed surfaces, then after applying finally many blowdowns, so S1 equivariant blowdowns, So you can blow up and down in the S1 category. And so you can do finally many S1 equivalent blow down, and then you do. So you are extendable. So then, uh, then uh, the resulting system can be extended. So I still have that picture there. I want, so for instance, I want to get rid of that bad point in the middle, the one labeled with three. I can blow it down because, well, it's a result of Hattori that you can. You can blow it down, and I'll show you later what the resulting system is, and then you can get rid, you get rid of it, and what you have afterwards satisfies E2 as well, so it's extendable. Okay, so I told you about S1 spaces. Let me tell you about semitoric systems. And now, you see, I told you, so Hamiltonian integrable systems are really Hamiltonian R2 actions. Now, when you deal with non-compact group actions, and in this case, they're not proper, forget about a priori, you know, nice a priori results about connectivity of the fibers, convexity of the moment map. A priori, there's no such thing. You shouldn't expect any such thing. The amazing thing about semitoric systems is that the fibers of the moment map are connected. Now, I can't stress how important this is. This is beautiful. And this is a result due to Bull-Nock. The theorem if, so if this is semitoric, then phi inverse, oops, this is phi, phi inverse of C is connected for all C in phi of M. Now you see, you have connectivity of the fibers, and this follows from ideas used to prove the idea Gilliam and Sternberg convexity theorem plus the extra control that you have by prescribing the singular behavior. Okay, so you say, okay, now you, know, you kind of cheated us. You pre first told us that you shouldn't expect any convexity result at first, and now you show that fibers are connected. Still, so this is a big warning, Phi of M need not be convex. So you, you don't have, you know, convexity on the nose. And as my grandmother used to say in Neapolitan, if you want to look beautiful, if you want to achieve convexity, you have to suffer a little. So you have to think a little bit. Yeah? So in order to achieve convexity, which is there because we know that connectivity of the fibers is related to convexity, we have to think. But before we start thinking, let's do another. So let's look at a system. So the image of a moment map of a system, it may look something like this. 
and I've lost my red. Good. Um, so let me tell you what the connected fibers look like. So the, this is a system on CP2. And the image of the moment map can be taken to, be look, to look like this. So if I take a regular value, so something in the interior, it's, I, I have a torus. Locally, this is given by the Louisville Arnold theorem. Uh, which also implies that locally, so I told you that you have a Hamiltonian R2 action. In fact, you have a Hamiltonian S1 times R action because one of the two integrals induces an S1 action. So locally, in fact, you can, you can make this action descend to a Hamiltonian T2 action. So in some sense, you can, you know, you find the period locally. So there's a notion in which, you know, you can find periods locally. The local normal form tells you that, for instance, pre-images of points on the interior of these edges are circles, and of these vertices are fixed points. And, and I remain to tell you, I only want to tell you now, I only need to tell you now, about this, the pre-image of this bad boy there. And this is, so fortunately Alvaro showed us a better picture than this earlier, it's a pinched torus. Now, a priori, if I don't make any assumption, this torus could be multiply pinched. I will make the assumption that only, th only uh, so there is only one pinch on a torus. So this is, this is in some sense crucial, and I've been working with Rui Fernandes on understanding what happens in cases when you have more. Um, there are some subtleties, but I won't go into them. So this, there is an assumption here. However, this assumption is not crucial for the statement of the next theorem. Which is, so you want convexity. Convexity is tightly related to finding a Hamiltonian T2 action because it's, con it's tightly related to, convex to connectedness of the fiber and a compact action. However, if you start on a small neighborhood here with this Hamiltonian T2 action and you try and extend it going around this bad point, you can't. You know, the way in which you compactify the action in some sense is not consistent as I transverse this because it's not simply connected. This is a phenomenon known as monodromy. And Matveev and Zung independently proved that focus focus fibers gives rise to this. And the problem is that I'm not simply connected. If I were simply connected, I could rectify things. So along comes Sandelnock and says, aha, I know what. Let me, make, let me force this to be simply connected. Later on, maybe I'll pay a price. But let me force it to be simply connected. And how do I force something to be simply connected? Well, I cut. You know, if, if I have a circle and I cut it, I make things simply connected. So le and, and, I, and there is a preferred direction, which is vertical, because I have an S1 action. And this S1 action corresponds to the vertical direction. And so now, if I, if I take, if I compactify the action on, on the left of this, and I go around, well, well, I can't go around, so you know, I can compactify it everywhere. So that's nice. However, and that's when my grandmother comes back to remind me, I pay a price. You have to suffer a little. And this is the statement of the theorem. So upon the choice, and this is due to Von Gogh, upon a choice of vertical cuts, one for each focus focus fiber there exists a map f from the image of the moment map to r2 which is a homeomorphism onto its image with satisfying three key properties and more in fact well as i said we have a global S1 action because J induces an S1 action. And this F tells you how to make the action T2, in the, how to make the S1, action, S1 times R action descend to a T2 action. So 
I can choose this f to be of this form. It doesn't do anything to the first component because j is already good. It's already compact, the action induced by j. Now comes something, which is if I have m, I look at phi, I get the image here. I look at f, and I get something that I call pf, and I look at the composite psi. This is a smooth moment map of an effective Hamiltonian T2 action away from the pre-image of the cuts. No, you can have more than one. Only, I'm only saying that for each, each time, because of this assumption where I only have one point here, every time I see a mark point like this, I have to make a choice. But you, a priori, you could have two on the same vertical line. And the third property, and this is, you know, you pay a price. This is smooth away from some locus, which is small, but it's, you lose smoothness. But the price that you pay has the effect that the image here, PF, is a convex, simple, rational polygon. Yes? Oh, maybe I only heard my voice. So you see, this looks an awful lot like a Delzant type condition. It's not smooth. And let me show you an example. So you have this system, the one that I drew over there. If I pick my cut to go up, say, my f, the image of my f, may look something like this. Now you check this fails to be smooth at this vertex, which isn't really a vertex because I've, you know, I've, I'm forcing it in, but it fails to be smooth. If I, if I take the cut downwards, perhaps this f will give me something like this. And this is smooth. You can check. So both can occur up, upon choosing the cuts in some direction or other. OK, let me make a warning. We've seen that sometimes the image of the moment map does not tell you everything about the symplectic manifold that you deal with. And this is exactly the case. Palayan will not give a complete list of invariants. I will not go into those. But there are more things than just the shape of the polygon and the position of this, and the number and position of these focus focus values. But they, they're not very important for this talk. However, and this is a theorem that I proved with Sonia and Sylvia last year, any PF associated to m omega jh, so this is a semitoric system, can be used to recover uh, the gamma associated to m omega j. So by looking at this, at any one of these polygons, I can reconstruct the Karchon graph. And the situation is very similar to the toric situation. So in fact, you see, these bad points occur sufficiently far away from the extrema that if, you, if I have a fixed surface, they have to occur at the extrema, and the picture looks toric locally. So, so if m omega j arises as in here, so if it comes from a semitoric system, then, well, fixed surfaces have genus zero. But now something weaker than E2 happens. The only thing that stays true is that on a given vertical line, I only hit two components of the boundary. 
And now the ZK spheres correspond to edges in this curved polygon here. So for any x in the interior of the image of the J moment map, uh, the number of ZK spheres that intersects J inverse of x is at most 2. So this is weaker than this. This system here, so this S1 space in the bottom right corner, satisfies C2. Because I only have two ZK spheres on the x equals 3 vertical line. So if the speaker is to, believe, is to be believed in, in his buildup, I gave you necessary conditions for a Hamiltonian S1 space to come from a semitoric system. So now you expect that the theorem says that these are sufficient conditions. So if m omega j satisfies C1 and C2, then there exists a semitoric system. You don't expect any uniqueness here because there's no uniqueness even in the toric case. But what we will do, and I will illustrate this with an example, is in fact that we construct the system that has, so if I give you a Hamiltonian S1 space, it may fail to satisfy this E2 because of the presence of these isolated vertices in the graph. These bad points, you know, this point labeled with three on top. So the number of those will tell you exactly how many focus focus singularities you have to put in. And this is, you know, a sharp result. So we construct some sort of, some sort of minimal semitoric extension. Okay, so idea of proof. Well, if m omega j satisfies, uh, what did I call it, E2, then you're done. Because if, you're, if you can be extended to a toric system, then certainly you're semi-toric. So then you want to proceed by induction. So this is like a base case. So you want to proceed by induction on, and let me call it like this, you have the condition C2, which is there, minus E2. So by the obstruction for something that satisfies C2 to satisfy E2. So now this is the time when I come here. So I have this system. This fails exactly only, it only has one of these bad interior points. OK? I know that these bad interior points, by work of Hattori and subsequently Karshon, they can be blown down. Now, two important things here. If I'm assuming that the base case is sorted, I can assume that there is, exist, there is at least one of these bad points. In particular, I'm not extendable, which in particular means that I have a fixed surface. Because if I were, you know, if, if I only had isolated fixed points, I'd be extendable. So this is why I can blow this bad point down. And you can always blow it down towards the fixed surface. Exactly. So I can always squeeze it into the fixed surface. And look at what happens. Yes, I can make it disappear, but I fatten up the area of the fixed surface. OK. So I look at this. And the inductive hypothesis says that I have one fewer of these points. We call these points the defect of the system. Now, in this illustrating example, this is toric. Or in some sense, it has lower defect, because I started with something the defect one, one of these bad points. And I blow down to something that has lower defect. So I can use the inductive hypothesis. I can say, well, it's, I've now a system with lower defect. I can extend it. In this case, I give you a toric extension. This is not to scale. I will show it to you to scale. But you can check this is a Delzant polygon. It's not immediate to see it, but you can construct it. Um, and those in Utrecht who've seen me play with polygons know how long I've spent trying to do these things. OK, so what? 
Now you blew down. Now you want to blow up. You want to come back, right? You want to, fit, to put the, the bad point back in. And you want to do it in a way that is S1 equivariant, but in fact S1 times R equivariant, not T2. You won't be able to do it T2 equivariantly. Only S1 times R. Now, as many of you know, if you only perform a symplectic blow up, there's a huge amount of choice. If you perform an S1 equivariant blow up, the amount of choice is not so big because the size is all you can have. But here, in the semitoric blow up, you can make choices. And these choices are related to the invariants that I haven't told you about of the Palaio knock classification. So let me show you what the resulting polygon can be taken to be. So this is the toric system. It looks like this. So now trying to draw this to scale on a piece of paper, it's hard. And, well, OK. So this is what you have as one of the polygons for the semitoric system that extends the original system that you started with. Let me comment about this, because this construction is quite dramatic at the level of, uh, of, at the level of polygons for someone who's used to toric blow-ups. But the idea is very similar. So if you take a small neighborhood of the dashed line, and you look at a small neighborhood of the line that go, of the sequence of lines that goes from the origin to 3, 3, you realize that those two are related, well, yes, they're related by an integral Laffan transformation. Mm -hmm. So I use that integral Laffan transformation to glue in away from the cut the toric systems. I get a non-compact toric system, and now I have to fill in by putting in the, uh, the focus focus singularity, but fortunately, we know how to do this because this was, you know, the techniques are techniques a la uh, Pelai and Bunglock for their construction result of integral of semitoric systems. So in fact, this exists. I, I can construct it to you and I can make it smooth. And let me make two or three concluding remarks. Sorry for going slightly over time. The first one is, in future work, we'd like to understand the full complexity of the um, semitoric blow up, exactly how many choices you have. This is, blowing up is a very important um, operation in symplectic geometry, and especially in four-dimensional geometry. The second remark is that now this story works in dimension four because everything already has been classified. Now, if you look at higher dimensions, say you go to six dimensions, now, what's the equivalent? The equivalent you want to extend a T2 action, because the, remember, you wanted the reduced space to be surfaces. Now, this side of the story has been worked out by the beautiful works of Yael Karchon and Sue Tolman. So you know how to classify these things. The other side of the story is what Christophe here in the audience has been starting to work on. And we're still developing the semitoric, you know, the six-dimensional analog of the semitoric story. So there is work to be done, and there is hope. I personally think that in higher dimension, once Christoph's work comes to you know, the nice end that I'm hoping that it does, that you can relate the two theories in a very similar fashion. And then, let me make the third remark. I want to go back to the very hard question, which Hamiltonian S1 spaces can be extended to well-behaved integrable systems? Now you see, in some cases, you have genus greater than zero. Oops, beep, 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 beep. Right, like the top right uh, thing. And now here, the reduced spaces will be surface of genus, surfaces of genus G. There you can put a Morse function, right? But it will not only have elliptic, you know, there will be saddle points. So you expect hyperbolic singularities. And I, also, I flicker between thinking that all Hamiltonian S1 spaces, once you allow hyperbolic singularities, will be extendable to integrable systems and thinking that there is a restriction. So I have no idea whether this can be done, but. So this is basically what happens when you do exactly what you did, that you draft the assumption that there's no hyperbolic. Exactly. So I'm trying, I, I'm trying, and in order to deal with hyperbolic singularities, I spoke a little bit with San Vunok about this. One can make some assumptions, and there is some hope somewhere, but it's not near. It's, there, there is some non-trivial work to be done afterwards. But it's an interesting question, so I'm, you know, I'm making some propaganda for the question. So, so this is sort of a bad question, but is the reason that they ruled out hyperbolic singularities originally because they make life much harder, or because the interesting cases don't happen? Uh, I, 
talk about that originally to the, the classification of the Lagrangian foundation, and you see that when we look at it uh, with the Lowry focus on singularity, you see how the, 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 the crucial property of the, that the Lagrangian foundation are not fully connected, which we lose uh, when you allow uh, the So, in, to, to use Margaret's jargon, the former rather than the latter, but they also had some motivating examples on non-compact manifolds which exhibited this behavior, which was the simplest to understand after the Tory case. So after that, thank you very much for your patience, and I'm sorry to have gone over time. Starting with well, in dimension six, I'm, I'm talking dimension four. Oh, okay. Dimension six, I agree. I totally agree with you. But yeah, yeah. dimension four, you know, this this is a very strong constraint. from being toric. So here there's one. I will our methods construct a system that has exactly as many of those points as focus focus singularities. So this is, you know, there are other ways of introducing focus focus singularities, but we don't deal with that. We, we only use this semi-toric blow-up technique. There's no novel traits as they're known in the literature. So this, in some sense, this is essential. So we can, do, but we can talk later. Every semi toric system in four dimensions would be boiled down to a toric system? Oh, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. So, you, you, so, this is, you know, some. I spoke to some people and, I, and they asked me, okay, so how do you go from toric to semi toric? If you come from a world of toric systems, why on earth? You know, if you haven't seen any mechanical problems, why on earth do, do these focus focus singularities come from? And the answer, in some sense, is you have to look at S1 equivariant blow ups that are, you know, equivariant uh, blow ups that cannot be made toric because they're too large. So this is how these focus focus similarities come about from you know purely abstract point of view. But you can go the other way. Yeah, you can go the other way. You can also yeah. Yeah. So in your semi-toric law, are you actually realizing everything that you the Yes. There, there are no obstructions to the remembrance. No. Maybe another comment about the hyogenous Sorry? You really need to have odd indices. So there has to be hyperbolic. 
Yeah, no, of course, no, no, you have to have a lot, but uh, presumably you might be able to do semi toric homogeneous therapies and develop them into the arbitrary homogeneous case and do the acetolence um, surgery. I'm not aware of the surgery, and I'd like so to know more about it. Yeah, I, can, so, I mean, I can't see the details, but at least I would expect that your surgery should. Or you have an announcement? No, it wasn't a question. <laughs> <laughs> it could be also an The honest answer. But I think it's a very valid question. So if you just ask, I give a full manifold with an S1 action. Now, clearly, you, you don't necessarily want that S1 action to be induced by a Hamilton S1 because it's, uh, it has a whole lot of me. So I don't know. I, I haven't thought about this, but I, I suspect that that's a very good question as well because this, this satisfies this property of, of being vital in this sense. Yeah. 